episode 65, Medical Doctor, Spiritual Advisor, and Mindfulness Guru, Dr. Deepak Chopra. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Deepak Chopra. Deepak is a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well-being and humanitarianism, and Chopra, a modern-day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. Deepak is also a clinical professor of family medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego. He's the author of over 90 books, including numerous New York Times bestsellers, the latest one titled Total Meditation. Time Magazine has described Dr. Chopra as one of the top 100 heroes and icons of the century. Deepak, welcome to the show. Thank you, Glenn. Well, I believe you grew up in India, and your father, as I understand it, was a prominent cardiologist. So, fair to say that you had a pretty comfortable upbringing? I had uh, what is called a middle class, uh, upper middle class uh, upbringing. My father was a cardiologist, but he's also in the army. He was a professor of medicine. And uh, we traveled a lot, like army families. And was he a big influence on your wanting to pursue medicine, either you know, as a role model or even perhaps having high expectations of you? Yes, he was a role model for many reasons. First of all, you know, he was trained in England as a fellow of the College, uh, Royal College of Physicians. But then he came back to India after he got his training. And when there was a war going on between uh, China and India in 1959, I believe, 58 or something, and there were a lot of skirmishes and battles up in Tibet, he actually landed a plane in Leh, uh, which is uh, for the first, it may have been one of the first few times that a plane had landed at that height in Tibet. And while people were shooting across the border on both sides. He was doing cardiac cath, and he was one of the first people to identify what we today call mountain sickness, and he became very famous. He published his work, and then, you know, when he went into private practice on weekends, he would see patients for free, and my mother would cook food for them, and then when they left, my parents made sure that they had enough uh, money to pay their bus fare or their train fare. When we left this town that uh, I remember, I was seven years of age at that time or eight years, there were a thousand people on the railway station to see us off because my parents were real healers. He was a doctor, he was a cardiologist, he was a storyteller, he was an adventurer, he was a researcher, he prayed for his patients and my mother cooked food for them. That was the inspiration. Well, given you know, how well he was known there and, and uh, how prominent his practice was. What drew you to the U.S. to do your residency? Why not stay put in India? When I was in last year of medical school, my father, of course, was a British trained doctor and India was just opening up to technology. The medical school I went to, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, was the same government institution as the IITs, Indian Institutes of Technology. So the medical school and the Indian Institutes of Technology were Nehru's vision for the next 100 years. He was the founding prime minister. Unfortunately, everybody ended up in America and Silicon Valley, the engineers and the doctors uh, ended up in America as well. All those of us who were trained at these amazing institutions and my father and the last year of my medical school, he said, you know, British training was good for me, but for you, you need to go to America and get the best technology training as well, because the future of medicine is going to be very different. And then you come back and you take over. 
well, I never went back. It was so seductive to be here and learn and explore and hang out with my colleagues and explore, you know, all the new things that we were looking at. Yeah. Well, well I guess just to fast forward that story, you weren't just an okay physician. Uh, you know, you were doing quite extraordinarily well as an endocrinologist. And uh, I believe you became the chief of medicine at New England Memorial Hospital. The chief of staff. Chief of staff. But but then at some point, Deepak, it seems that you just somehow, I don't know if this was like an overnight thing or just slowly over time, you became disillusioned, I guess, with Western medicine. So w what was that experience? I mean, clearly you took to it. You did really well, established a great practice, made a name for yourself. What happened along the way? Well, I, you know, disillusioned may be a strong word. So there were many things happening. My training was in neuroendocrinology. So we were looking at brain chemistry in the late 70s. At that time, not many people knew about things like serotonin and dopamine and opiates and oxytocin and all these brain peptides. One of my colleagues was a woman called um, Candice Pert, who later became the chief of brain chemistry at NIH. And one day in a lab, you know, we were having grand rounds or something. She mentioned the word molecules of emotion when referring to these serotonin, dopamine, etc. I immediately realized at that moment that these molecules were also immunomodulators. So I started directing my research there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, as a physician, I noticed that there were people, uh, you know, you could see two patients who had the same illness, say the same doctor, same treatment, different outcomes. So I then realized that what we were doing was very effective for acute intervention. You have pneumonia, you need an antibiotic. You have a uh, break your leg, you need to see an orthopedic surgeon. You have appendicitis, you should probably get it out before you get an abscess. But when it came to chronic disease, uh, everything from uh, autoimmune illness to arthritis to rheumatoid arthritis, bron bronchial asthma, uh, hypertension, heart disease, even cancer, the gene mutations that lead to these diseases, only 5% are penetrant, fully penetrant, which means if you have that particular gene mutation, you will get the disease. Somebody has a Baraka gene for breast cancer, they're going to get the illness anyway. Mm -hmm. So Angelina Jolie had a preventive mastectomy. But for the remaining 95%, even genetic mutations that predispose to disease, Lifestyle influences the outcome, sleep, stress management, exercise, breathing, emotions, nutrition, connection with nature. But most importantly, the ability we all have for self-regulation or homeostasis or resetting the feedback loops of our body, which are connecting mind and body. And since the last 30 years, we've learned so much about that, you know, with epigenetics, with neuroscience, with um, what happens in different states of awareness to the body. All I have to do is give you bad news right now and your blood pressure will go up. Your platelets will get... <laughs> yes, that's, this is true. But Deepak, we're, we're talking you know, decades ago before all of this was known. And, and certainly you didn't study this in med school. I know even to this day, med schools are pretty you know, sparse with what they do around integrative medicine. So were, were these just topics that you learn on your own? I was learning from my patients. You know, patients would come to me and say, I changed my diet and my arthritis went away. <laughs> or I changed my diet and asthma improved. I learned this breathing technique and I don't have bronchial asthma anymore. And so, you know, at first I didn't believe them. How could changing the diet influence you know, the outcome of coronary artery disease or bronchial asthma. But then I started to listen to them. And as the data started to emerge about uh, what you call bio, microbiome, epigenetics and inflammation in the body, I realized that we did not have the science for this, unfortunately. Well, I read this and you can correct me if my, uh, my internet facts <laughs> are, uh, are wrong. And it's hard to even think of this knowing what you've become but that um, before you had made that leap, back when you were practicing, that you had started developing a really bad smoking habit. I think I read a, a bad drinking habit as well. And so it, it almost sounds like, uh, I, I guess ironically, here you are as a doctor trying to help people and you're, you're sort of killing yourself. 
So my first memory is in Boston at the Boston VA Hospital, Grand Rounds, being given by the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Franz Ingelfinger, one of the most famous physicians in our country. He would take a break in the middle of a lecture and light up a cigarette. That gave permission to all the residents to light up a cigarette. And on Fridays, every resident and intern got drunk, except the one who were on call. I remember intubating a patient, putting him on a ventilator, putting him, uh, giving him a pacemaker, resurrecting his heart, basically, and putting him under the machine in the ICU and then going outside the hospital and smoking a cigarette. Before then, even doctors were advertising lucky strikes and camel cigarettes unfiltered as good for your health or increase your energy. So that was the ecosystem in which uh, we were trained, by the way, as physicians. Wow. And so I think you were, I believe, 45 years old, peak of your career, right? And, and you just resigned from the hospital, you sort of walked away from Western medicine and opened up your own center for integrated medicine, as I understand it. I did. Yeah. And, and then somewhere either before that or, or during that time, you also found someone that taught you about transcendental meditation. And I think that sort of opened your eyes to a whole new world that you hadn't been familiar with before. I learned transcendental meditation at the age of 34. So by then I had already stopped smoking and drink, drinking. My internship started at the age of 22. So it was all during the stressful training period that I was doing all of that. 34, I started meditation, changed my lifestyle altogether. Then it's then that I became chief of staff and all of that. And I had a very busy practice. I had 30 patients in outpatient, 30 patients inpatient, 10 patients in the ICU, <laughs> even though my, my personal habits now were very good. It was still very stressful because, you know, doctors were very busy in those days. Vietnam War had finished and all kinds of things were happening. There was a stressful environment for all of us physicians. So at the age of 45, when I left Boston and everything else, actually what was happening was my colleagues were very skeptical about what I was saying, and they were almost embarrassed. And there was also this academic resentment in the environment. I was remember in the ecosystem, I was on staff periodically at Harvard, BU, Tufts, etc. I had the feeling I was going to be fired anyway, so I left and went to California. Mm. And I know you don't pride yourself on the you know the people you work with per se, but you did end up with some very well known clients, probably still to this day. But you know, Michael Jackson and Oprah and Madonna, and I'm sure there there are dozens of others. How do you go from opening up an integrative medicine practice, something very new? to all of a sudden being the sought after spiritual guide for so many of these people? It was in a way uh, surprising. I mean, I, one day my phone rang and uh, I, this is Marlon Brando. Another day the phone rang, this is George Harrison. This is Elizabeth Taylor or Michael Jackson. And so I said, what the heck is going on? Now, I used to come to California those days frequently to the TM center, the meditation center. So mm -hmm. slowly they became part of my practice in a sense. And I started to learn a lot about them. Then as I started to explore mind, body, mind, body, mind, body, and you know, there's this zeitgeist now that we use these words, mind, body, spirit. And I realized that we had no good definition for either the body, nor the mind, nor the spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was one of the things. I'd go to conferences and mind-body conferences, psychology conference, say, can anybody tell me what the mind is? Nobody could give me a definition. Can anybody define the body as an anatomical structure? Do we have a fixed body? Is it a frozen sculpture or is it a noun or is it a verb? Do we have a soul? Is there such a thing as spirit? No one could give me an answer, except when I went to Eastern wisdom traditions where body, mind, and soul and the environment were a unified process in consciousness. That's when I really got interested in spirituality from a scientific perspective. What's the source of thought? 
I mean, nobody can tell you right today in the scientific world what the source of thought is, what is the source of imagination, of intuition, of inspiration, of, uh, of uh, higher consciousness, if it, is there such a thing of transcendence. So I started exploring on my own and meeting people who actually had some clarity on these things. What is the mind? You know, Dan Siegel, the neuropsychiatrist at UCLA once said, the mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates energy and information in the body. I had never heard of that before. And I took that seriously and started to examine that. Then I started to examine what cognitive scientists are calling the hard problem of consciousness. How does the brain produce experience? Nobody knows. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, mm -hmm. uh, all that's coming to your ears are the vibrations of atmosphere. All that's going to your brain is an electrical current. All that's happening in your brain is uh, electrochemistry, but you're hearing my voice. How does that happen? That's called the hard problem of consciousness. No one knows. No one knows how you produce sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, perceptions, imagination. And there's no scientific answer. In fact, this if you go into today science and you ask, go on Google and type out 125 open questions in science. The first one is what the universe is, what's the universe made of? Make a long story short, it's made of nothing. The second question is, how does the brain produce consciousness? And the answer is we don't know. And maybe those are two wrong questions. Maybe these are two wrong questions because we assume that the universe actually exists as we perceive it, number one. Not realizing that what we experience as the universe is a human experience, not a crocodile experience, a butterfly experience, the experience of an insect with a hundred eyes. So what we call the human universe is a human construct, number one. Number two, there's no basis for consciousness that can be identified because even the brain is an experience in consciousness. So I had to go back all the way to spiritual traditions to see what they said. What did Wittgenstein say? What did Plato say? What did George Berkeley say? What did the Eastern mystics say? What did the... Zen philosophers say, what did the prophets of the Old Testament say? say? And when you look at this body of all this literature, you realize that they had some clue into what is called spiritual experience. What is transcendence? How do you overcome the fear of death? And what are these platonic values that everybody wants? Truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. Where is this longing coming from? How, does the brain produce longing? Does the brain produce the desire for enlightenment? So all these questions occupied me for years. But then I started hanging out with people for a short phrase, I can say sages, scientists, psychotics, and geniuses. It's a motley group of people. <laughs> and they all have some inkling of a deeper reality. And then the rest happened by itself. I, I guess for clarification, I think you actually distinguish the brain from the mind. What is the distinction between the two? So the brain, you know, the, the question in science today is, does the brain do the mind? Or does the mind do the brain? Or they do each other? Okay. Because you have a thought right now. Uh, let's take a simple thought. Lift your right hand up. And it starts with a thought. And the rest is all electrochemical. Mm -hmm. But how does the thought become electrochemical activity? Nobody knows. That's the hard question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, wiggle your toes. Same thing. Nobody knows how that happens. The first step is a miracle. The rest is easily explained. Now, let me try to give you another thought. Uh, I told you, think of some bad news right now and your blood pressure will go up. But now think of or imagine in your head, imagine the face of someone you love and listen to their voice and feel the emotion. So, you know, for me, that could be my wife or my child or my mother or anyone else. Mm -hmm. I have an image, I can hear a voice and I can feel the emotion. Problem is in the brain, 
All I see is electrochemical activity. So where is this experience happening? You know, yesterday I got stuck with a song in my head, imagined by John Lennon. It wouldn't go away. I could hear it, but there's no sound in my brain. So what the heck is going on? Is the mind creating the brain or brain creating the body? And the real answer is neither. It's awareness or consciousness or what spiritual traditions call a deeper reality in which the mind is an experience of thoughts and images, imagination and emotions. And the body and the physical world and the brain are perceptual activities of the same consciousness. So what we experience as perceptual activity, we call the physical world, physical objects, and our physical body. What we experience as cognitive interpretation of those perceptual activities, we call the mind, but they are parallel activities in consciousness, which, by the way, has no location. So if I think, say, imagine the song, John Lennon, imagine, that has no location. That has no physical location. Imagine a rainbow or a sunset has no physical location, but it's correlates, brain and mental correlates run parallel to each other. So body and mind are one entity in the same way as mass energy, in the same way as space time, in the same way as wave particle. It's, it's a difficult transition for conventional science to make, but slowly it is happening right now. You talk to cognitive scientists and the biggest argument right now is the world real or are we constructing it in every act of perception? And that's true of our body and our mind as well. My, uh, <laughs> my, my, my brain is hurting just listening to all this, uh, but uh, good stuff. I read that uh, you've never been sick. Is that true? Well, I've never had a chronic illness. My mother told me I had measles uh, when I was a kid. And, you know, I, I don't get colds and I'm healthy, so... I would say that's true. I've never had surgery, never been hospitalized. Um, I, I, I don't have time to be sick. I've also read that you're slowing down your aging process. And if, if, if that's the case, is this based on biological markers you're looking at or just that you, you feel younger, you look younger? What, what's behind that? So traditional biological markers are things like blood pressure, bone density, body temperature regulation, sugar metabolism, immune function, skin thickness, hormones, a number of wrinkles. By those standards, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm in my 30s with traditional biological markers. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some other biological markers which are more precise, telomerase activity, inflammation in the body, etc. And also something very interesting, you can look at the microbiome of the body, the 2 million plus extra genes that are not human, and you can get some assessment of biological age. So today, there's a lot of interest in separating biological age from chronological age and even psychological age. Mm -hmm. So given that, I am actually on a project to reverse my biological age. I've been on that for the last three years changing my microbiome, doing yoga every day, uh, exercise every day, keeping healthy emotions, eating food that is, has maximum diversity on, of plant-based foods, monitoring my microbiome and inflammatory markers. When I'm ready to announce this, this data, along with others, we will hopefully have a science for at least temporarily reversing the biological process. For those that maybe aren't familiar with the term microbiome, this is our gut bacteria, basically, right? Just like the brain, there's so little we know about it, other than the fact that it has a lot of ramifications on a lot of our systems in our body, our immune systems and respiratory systems and pretty much everything. Actually, even more than that, Glenn. So um, let me explain how the microbiome works. So when you were conceived, you acquired 25,000 genes from your parents. That's the deck of cards that began your life as a fertilized ovum. That, that's all I have to blame, yes. <laughs> okay, so you can't change the deck of cards you got, but now you're going to have to play poker, okay? And so 25,000 human genes, but as you entered the world, and may I ask you a personal question? Please. Were, were you a cesarean or were you naturally born? It was natural. Okay, good. So as you come out of the birth canal, the baby swallows, inhales, and is covered by 
the vaginal secretions of the mother. Mm -hmm. And so these vaginal secretions have millions of bacteria. And these bacteria have genes. And so in a regular normal birth, you acquire 2 million extra genes when you come into this world. Now today, some obstetricians who actually understand the science, when they do a cesarean section, they actually take the mother's secretions, put some in the mouth, put some in the nose, and then put some in the body. So they do a second inoculation mm -hmm. genes. Two million bacterial genes, 25,000 human genes. So you have less than 1% of the genetic population in your body is human. Now, if you go to the Amazon and you go under the surface of the earth, you take one teaspoon of soil from there, you'll find actually many more genes more than you would find in New York City. In fact, all the biodiversity of all life on this planet is under the earth in rainforests. So what has happened in the last few decades of industrial food production is that manufactured, refined, processed, and food that's very high in concentrated sugar or insecticides or pesticides, which contain petroleum products, and of course we have genetic food production too, the microbiome, the original microbiome has disappeared. 30% of the microbiome has disappeared in the Western world. Like it could be more than that. And now people are suggesting that inflammation of the microbiome as a result of manufactured food or industrially produced food, inflammatory food is ruining the body's ecosystem, which is causing inflammation, which is causing inflammatory disease, including chronic disease. Even the COVID-19 pandemic, if you look at the data, you can make a case for the connection between climate change, eco-destruction, extinction of species, destruction of genetic information, which leads to mutations. Now, when I say this, people roll up their eyes, but a lot of geneticists now are agreeing with that. So there is no long-term solution even to these chronic diseases unless we address the total genetic information of biological systems, not just human, but the entire ecosystem. So there's the planetary microbiome, which includes viruses. Virome includes fungi, mycomes, and bacteria. Now, COVID has existed for 55 million years. The coronavirus has existed for 55 million years. Every year we have an influenza pandemic, which is a coronavirus. And I think that these mutations are only going to get worse unless we repair the ecosystem of our planet. Wow. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump into the book. Total Meditation. By the way, not your second or third or 12th book, your 91st book, which in itself is incredible. It, it's a really content-rich book. Um, it's hard to summarize all that's going on there. I think at a high level here, the premise of the book is that despite all of the proven benefits of meditation, most people just don't stick with it. Life just sort of gets in the way. Deepak, I'm guilty myself. I have started and stopped, I don't know how many times now, probably a dozen times over the years, uh, a meditation practice. And so you offer as an alternative what you coin total meditation, which is essentially the practice of bringing the mind into a meditative state whenever you want. So I guess whenever you notice that you're feeling stressed or you're feeling anxious, you're distracted, you return to the mind's natural state of inner peace and quiet. So for starters, I just want to understand this point about the mind's natural state. And I'm not trying to be you know, facetious, but I feel like that is not my mind's natural state. It is always racing. There's way, way too much noise. I can't seem to ever quiet it. And that seems to feel like the default state for me. So maybe I'm doing something wrong, but could you just help me? First of all, did, did I get the, the gist of that right? And can you just yeah. help me with that? Right, because that's, that's the basis of this, which is that there's a natural reset point, just like with our bodies. And I want to be sure I connect those dots. Yeah, you did, correct. And so, you know, in medical school, when you go to medical school, the first two lessons 
in physiology are homeostasis and the second lesson is inflammation. And they are both uh, homeostasis, self-regulation, the baseline, every system in the body has a feedback loop. It's like a thermostat, you know. So if your temperature goes up or the heat goes up in the room, your body adjusts its temperature, blood pressure, bone density, all things, say heart rate, heart rate variability, immune function, they all have a set point like a thermostat. What we don't realize is the same thing is true of our mind because body and mind are the same thing. And our set point is actually visited back to baseline every night when we go to sleep. That's why when you get, when you wake up in the morning, you feel better if you've had a good sleep. Even in the dream state, unless you're having a nightmare, you're returning to the set point. Mm -hmm. So meditation just takes you deeper into the gap between what we call thoughts. So between every thought, there's a little gap. Between every image, there's a little gap. Between every sensation, perception, whatever, your words don't spill out all at the same time. I'm speaking to you right now. If I spilled out all these words at the same time, it would be gibberish. So between every word is a little gap of awareness where right now the sequential unfoldment of ideas, the syntax, the grammar, and everything is being orchestrated by whom? By me, but not in the thought itself, in the space between thoughts. So once you understand that, then it's any time you can slip into the space. And so next time you get reactive, you get agitated, Glenn, I would say, just stop and count to 10. And don't do anything and then respond. Your response will be different. Or just stop, pause, notice what's happening, feel it in your body, and then choose. These are ways to stop reactivity, stop being a biological robot that's being triggered by people and circumstance into predictable outcomes. You are at the mercy, mercy of every stranger on the street. Somebody says something good to you, you're flattered for the rest of your life, something offensive, you're offended for the rest of your life. Not a good way to live. So if you stop this reactivity, even by pressing the pause button and observing your reaction to react you've slipped into meditation mode. After that, it's an amazing adventure. And the steps are basically just close your eyes and breathe deeply. And where are you supposed to focus your thoughts so you don't focus on the reactive things? You can do whatever you want. If you stop and observe your breath, that's the first step. If you don't close your eyes, but observe your breath and count to the count of six, pause two seconds, then count out to the count of six. You've started stimulating your vagus nerve, decreasing your heart rate from 14 to eight, changing your heart rate variability. Once you realize you can do these tricks to self-regulate your body, you get fascinated by it. So I can drop my heart rate into the 40s just by intention. Okay, I can change blood flow to different parts of the body. Today, people are talking about interoception which in yogic traditions is called pratyahara, which means withdrawal of the senses, the ability to self-regulate your autonomic nervous system, something that's unknown in the West, but now is being looked at. And you know, all you have to do is look up interoception, and you see now science is very interested in not only how to regulate your nervous system, but your autonomic nervous system as well. You mentioned this goal of achieving a higher state of consciousness. Um, I, I think in your vernacular, total consciousness is what you use. So w what exactly does that mean, total consciousness? How does it relate to what we're talking about here? Okay, so, you know, Abraham Maslow identified five levels of human need, but he didn't go all the way, although I know that it's in his personal writings and his in his libraries, you can see that he was actually looking at the next two levels of human actualization, going beyond self-actualization. But here are the seven ways that people respond to any situation. The first is fight flight response. The second is the ego uh, reactive response. The third is being centered. The fourth is uh, intuition. The fifth is creativity. The sixth is a vision for a higher different reality. And the seventh is transcendence. So these are modes of human knowing, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, are the fundamental modes of knowing. But then we go a little deeper. We experience love, compassion. That's a mode of knowing. 
we experience intuition. It's a mode of knowing, creativity, mode of knowing. But finally, total consciousness is what is called pure knowing. You know without knowing, <laughs> which means spontaneous right action, spontaneous right choice making, and spontaneous intuitive knowledge. There are Sanskrit words for this. So spontaneous right action is called Kriya Yoga as opposed to Karma. Karma is recycled uh, behavior. Kriya is original creative behavior. That's called Kriya Yoga. Then there's Ichha Shakti, which means spontaneous choice making without anticipation, without regrets, without resistance. And then there's something called Ichha Shakti, Kriya Shakti, Gyan Shakti. So Kriya Shakti is spontaneous right action. Gyan Shakti is spontaneous knowing. And then um, there's spontaneous action. This is intuitive knowing. So when I get on a stage, for example, or even speak to you, I don't prepare. I, I actually go into that mode where I have the ability to respond to you because I'm also listening to you and um, it's being processed in the gap between my thoughts. That's total consciousness. It is also referred to in spiritual traditions as pure knowing, which is beyond perception and thought. You also, um, in the book, make the distinction between being asleep and being awake. You say that when we act unconsciously, we're asleep and we're awake when we act consciously. So examples, uh, we're asleep when uh, we arrive at snap judgments, when we act out of habit, out of bad habits, uh, when we embrace conformity, that's all being asleep. And then being awake is thinking before you speak and anticipating consequences of your actions, you know, not jumping to conclusions. So first of all, if, if I'm being truly honest, I guess uh, I'm, I'm asleep most of the time because these uh, feel like really poor ingrained habits I've had for many, many decades. So is, is that awakeness, total consciousness or a step to total consciousness? Can you please relate those for me? Glenn, it's a step. So the first thing to recognize is that you're, uh, all of us are habitual patterns of thinking, feeling and behavior are basically habitual patterns of being biological robots. There's nothing original about anything we do every day. Even our thoughts are recycled social media or recycled news or recycled opinion. So nothing about us in our everyday life suggests anything that is creative. It's we are bamboozled by the hypnosis of social conditioning to recycle old stories and same habitual responses because we are so used to our habitual certainties. Now, waking up simply means to be aware of that. If you are aware that you're a biological robot and you just press the pause button for a second, you can choose a response that is more nurturing, more holistic, doesn't have a Windows orientation, is healing. That's true of speech as well. You know, a lot of damage is being done in the world just through speech right now. This whole political discourse is contentious speech, which is recycling the agitation of the collective mind, which is totally insane at the moment um, because of this recycling of vicious speech. So as long as you can choose consciously what you want to say, I'm looking at this dessert right now, and I like it. It's a piece of chocolate. And, you know, normally I would just grab it and keep eating it till I was stuffed. Now I look at it, feel my body. I like it. And I choose to eat it and I enjoy it. And I actually, if I reflect on what the nature of chocolate is, I can discover the nature of the universe. So it becomes an adventure. Everything becomes an adventure. Would you say that self-awareness is, is part of being awake? It's the right word. Self-awareness leads to self-realization. That's it. Self-awareness. But the self is not the body. Self is not the ego. Self is not the mind. It is the awareness in which the body and the mind are a recycled process. So the self is silent. It's not thought. Okay. Once you have thought, it's not the self at all. It's in that awareness that thoughts come and go. The very fact that you can witness a thought or be aware of a thought 
tells you that you're not a thought. The fact that I can see my thoughts and observe them and witness them tells me I'm not my thoughts. I mean, back to why you wrote the book, everyone, I think, somehow feels like, yes, there's something positive about this meditation, about mindfulness. You know, it's such a buzz today, but then everyone, you know, starts and, and quits. And I don't know if it's so much the time commitment that's the issue as much as we're just programmed to want very immediate feedback. And I'll do it for you know, every day for maybe a month. And then I'll say, okay, do I feel differently? Am I less stressed? Do I feel less anxious? Do I feel more focused? And the reality is, I don't think it's something where it's meant to be this panacea where after, you know, a week or 30 days that suddenly magically you're a completely different person. It's years and years and years of practice. You know, if that's the case, do you feel this technique, what you're talking about, is much more immediate. It is, Glad, but on the other hand, anyone who says I don't have time needs more than anybody else. You know, the fact that you say don't have time, my answer is only busy people have time. Only busy people have time and make the time. And if you say I don't have time to do it once a day, you should be doing it twice a day. You need it more than anyone else. Just like when people say, I'm, you know, I'm tired, I don't have enough sleep, when, then you have to sleep. You know? That's the only way you solve the situation. Having said that, yes, I wrote Total Meditation for those people who want to slip into a glimpse and experience that quiet mind instantly. So I have lots of exercises in the book where people can start their journey and the journey can be 10 seconds or 15 seconds or a minute or five minutes. But sooner or later, if they are actually enjoying the process, they will see this is the way to harness their creativity and find solutions at a level which is above the level at which the problem was created. You know, many people have said there's no solution of a problem at the level of the problem. You have to go to another level and meditation helps you do that. So Deepak, do you ever get stressed? Are you ever anxious? Do, do you ever have your feathers ruffled? Or have you just gotten to this state where you're so much at peace with yourself and with the world that you know every day is just very peaceful and, and tranquil for you? I'm at peace with myself and the world, but at times I get sad at the situation of the world. And I wish that I few people will take the journey of waking up, we would see a different world. So I, right now I see a world uh, where there is social injustice, economic injustice, unsustainability, war, terrorism, extinction of species, mechanized ways of killing ourselves. So that makes me sad. I've created a new effort, a global effort right now, which is called uh, neveralone.love. The website is neveralone.love. We even have created a chatbot or the AI that can interact with anyone who's feeling lonely or depressed or and can identify if they have mental issues and can engage them in a conversation. One week of launching Never Alone and uh, uh, PV, the chatbot, which her name is PV, uh, she's a little chatbot, AI. Uh, we've actually in the first week intervened in 30 suicide attempts and it's increasing now. So I think it's possible through new technologies and collective intention and caring to in fact help each other. And my goal right now is just that. How can I engage in one word, the phrase would be love in action. Love without action is meaningless and action without love is irrelevant. But if we can create global, we are even thinking of creating a cryptocurrency and blockchain of love in action tokens that people can engage in and help each other in every way whatsoever, emotionally, with financial resources, with best practices, because we can't expect governments and special interest groups to do this. Kudos for doing that. I think uh, th there are a lot of people, probably increasingly so, with uh, you know the pandemic and other things happening in the world that we'll be needing to to turn to a resource like that. In the book, you mentioned that if you had the answers to just three questions, your life would thrive. You'd achieve all your goals. 
And the three questions are, what am I doing right? What isn't working for me? And what is my next step? So I'll take it that most of us aren't asking those questions. So what is it that we're asking instead? Asking for a solution. That's all. And, you know, you won't have solutions of issues that you're not aware of. Um, the first step is to be aware. So those questions are very important. And, you know, many people before us have said, uh, if you live the questions, life offers you the answers. You don't have to know the answers. Live the examined life, as has been said for thousands of years. A self-reflective examined life. So in addition to those questions, I also ask myself every day, who am I? What do I want? What's my purpose? What am I grateful for? And leave the results to the unknown. But somehow it helps me live a more conscious life. The name of this podcast is The Art of Excellence. I always end asking my guests how they define the word. The word excellence, does it have any meaning to you? Yes, it's the ability to actualize worthy goals, the ability to love and have compassion, and the ability to always be in touch with the creative center, which is your deeper awareness. That is excellence. This has been uh, the most uh, content-rich interview I've done. Fascinating topic. I uh, honestly learned a lot reading the book. Really made me think. You know, I appreciate all the many years and decades of, of work that it took to go into a book like that. And I appreciate that you're trying to make your world as accessible as possible to a broader audience like myself. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Glenn. It was a privilege and honor to be with you. Hey, thanks for listening. Okay, don't go. Don't go yet, please. Two favors. I ask simply two favors. One, if you could please download the iTunes app. You could do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. Um, take 60 seconds and leave a review. It means a lot. Two, you can find my episodes on several social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Find the one that you like the most. Find the one where you tend to have a lot of friends and followers. And if you could please either share it in the case of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn or retweet it uh, on Twitter, uh, that would mean the world to me. So those are the two asks I have. I love putting together this podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much. And I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.